I'm going to be talking today on the kinsman redeemer in the book of Ruth. I'm going to skip through some of the stuff quite quickly because there's a lot of detail. And as is my normal practice, if you want the detail, you can either get uh, copies from Sandy or download it off the website. So the detail is in the notes. But for the sake of time, we're going to move quickly. We use terms as Christians that often you forgot the significance of. One of them is redeem. We sing now about how our Saviour has ransomed me and redeemed us. And uh, I wonder how many of us actually remember what redeem means. Well, if you uh, take something to a pawn shop, perhaps, and later on you get the money to get it back, that's called redeeming something. Uh, recovering the ownership by paying a specified sum. Or it can also mean, as we use it in Christian circles, to save from a state of sinfulness and its consequences. Another meaning is to restore the honor, the worth, or the reputation. And there's a story that is told about a little boy who built this boat and used to love playing with it. And one day when he was at the lake playing with it, unfortunately the wind caught it and blew it away. And to his dismay, he lost his boat. And much later, when he was walking down the street, he saw his little boat in the window of a pawn shop. And he went in to tell the owner, well, that's my boat. And the owner told him, well, it might have been your boat at one time, but it's mine now. And if you want it back, it's going to cost you 200 rand. And so he went and he saved that money. And when, eventually, when he had saved up enough money, he went back and he bought this boat that he had originally built. And he said, little boat, you are mine. I made you and then I bought you back. You are twice mine. And, you know, the same applies to those of us who have been redeemed by God. He's our maker, but he not only made us, he bought us and he paid the price for us. He bought us back, he redeemed us. We are twice his. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 23 says, You were bought at a price. Salvation is free, but it costs Jesus everything. It's free for us. Now, in English, we use the word kinsman or relative. Uh, in the sense of someone who's a blood relation or else a relation by marriage. But in the Hebrew, that uh, definition of a kinsman went a lot further. And the root meaning of the word ga'al in Hebrew actually meant to redeem, deliver, buy back, ransom, rescue. And in the Old Testament, the kinsman redeemer was the closest male relative. And we're going to see that according to the law of Moses, they had certain rights and responsibilities to act on behalf of relatives who were either in need or uh, financial trouble or they needed vengeance because of their death. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to use four L's when it comes to the th Four things you could lose that a kinsman redeemer could assist you with. You could lose your land, your property. You could lose your liberty, your freedom. You could lose your life. And you could lose your legacy, which was the ability to produce offspring. So we found that in the Old Testament law, uh, Israelite never actually sold the land permanently. If you sold your land, you really just sold the usage of the land. The land returned to you in the 50th year of the year of Jubilee. But if you had actually had to sell your land due to hard circumstances, your nearest relative, we find in Leviticus 25, verse 25, was able to come and redeem what you had sold. They were able to redeem your property if they were able and if they were willing. And we find a case of this that's given in Jeremiah 32 where he says that his nearest relative uh, is going to contact him. The Lord tells him to come and redeem his property. It is your right and duty to buy it, Jeremiah was told. We see in the book of Ruth as well that um, Naomi's husband and her sons have died. And so she's obviously in a position where she's, going, uh, she's either sold her property or is going to lose her property. And we find the kinsman redeemer, Boaz, who... Uh, says, no one has the right to do it except you. He says, speaking to the kinsman redeemer, and I'm next in line. They wanted to redeem this property that had been lost. You know, then you could lose your land, you could lose your liberty. And you could become a slave in the ancient world, either by being captured by an invading army. army. You might have been born into slavery, because if your father and mother were slaves, you were automatically a slave. You were born into slavery. 
Or you might fall into debt and as a result be sold into slavery to pay for your debt. We see a case of this uh, in the book of Two Kings where a woman comes and pleads with Elisha and we know the story of how he assisted her with selling the, selling the oil. But her p- initial problem was that her husband had died and her creditors were coming to take her two boys as slaves. Could you regain your freedom as a slave? Yes, if your kinsman redeemer, your nearest relative, was able to have the right of redemption, even after you had sold yourself, and they could come and set you free by paying the price. You could also lose your life. And if you lost your life, the kinsman redeemer, remember in the Hebrew, Ga'al, it's in that context in the King James, they translated as the avenger of blood. It's actually the same word, kinsman redeemer, Ga'al. The avenger of blood. If you were murdered, the kinsman redeemer, your nearest relative, had the right and the responsibility to go and hunt down the person who had murdered you, and they were to get vengeance. And then you could lose your legacy. If you married and you died before having children, the responsibility fell on your brother or your nearest relative to marry the widow and have children, and those children would have your name. You wouldn't lose your legacy if the kinsman redeemer fulfilled his rights. And we find that this is what happened in the book of Ruth, where Boaz explains to the kinsman redeemer, the first in line, that when you buy the land, you're also going to acquire the dead man's widow. It was his responsibility to do that if he wanted to be the kinsman redeemer. This is also mentioned, remember, where Jesus is asked that question by the Sadducees, where they talk about the fact that this woman marries and the husband dies, and so the brothers keep on marrying her. It was all referring back to this law of the kinsman redeemer. Now, the result of Adam falling was that man lost four things. He lost his land, he lost his liberty, he lost his life, and he lost his legacy. What land, what property did we lose? Well, we find that in Psalm 115, verse 16, it says that the earth God gave to man. Remember, he said to Adam, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it. So the earth was given to man. Yet we find that when Satan speaks to Jesus and tempts him, he offers him what? The kingdoms of the world. And he says, for they have been given to me. Satan says the kingdoms of the world have been given to him. And Jesus didn't correct him and say, no, they were given to Adam. That is because man had his property stolen from him. Satan was right when he said it had been given to me. It had been given to him through the fall, through listening to Satan rather than to the Lord. Man lost his property. He lost the world. And that's why Satan is called by Jesus, the prince of this world. And like Esau, who sold his birthright to Jacob, so Adam sold the birthright that we had been given for food. Now, just to remind you, Satan is not in hell at present, as some mistakenly believe. That was taught in the Middle Ages by the amillennialists, who said that the church was going to rule the world, take over the world for Christ, and that Satan was already bound. Satan roams the earth, we see in the book of Job. In fact, he has access into God's presence. In the book of Job, he comes and stands before God. Okay, we find that Paul speaks of Satan stopping them when they wanted to do something. Peter speaks about Satan going around as a glory man, an adversary of the devil. Jesus speaks to Peter and he says, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Who would he ask? He would ask God. And so, as I mentioned, Jesus spoke about Satan as being the prince of this world. He also said Satan has a kingdom. He said if Satan drives out Satan, how can his kingdom stand? So he has a kingdom. Now, 1 John 5 verse 19 says the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So this world that was given to us, we lost. Adam lost to Satan. We lost our land. The powers of this dark world. Okay. The ruler of the kingdom of the air, he's called in Ephesians. The God of this world or the God of this age, Paul calls him in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. The prince of this world. Satan, as I've mentioned before, doesn't go and spend the night in hell. 
He's only going to go there at the end of the tribulation. And he wants to go there as much as you and I want to go there. He's not the ruler of hell. Hell is a punishment for him. And he's not in hell at the moment because we're not in the millennium. We're premillennialists. We believe Jesus comes first and then we have the millennium. Okay, not only did we lose our land, we lost our liberty. Because Jesus said everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And each and every one of you, including me, were born as a slave to sin because of Adam's sin. Paul says that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey them as slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin or to obedience. So we are born into slavery. Remember I said that you become a slave if your parents were really slaves, so we were born slaves. In addition, we find that Jesus speaks about Satan as being the force behind sickness and demon possession. The woman who was sick for 18 years, it says she was crippled by a spirit. And Jesus said, Satan has kept her bound for 18 long years. And when he is driving out demons, he spoke about if Satan drives out Satan, how is he? Uh, he's divided against himself. So he spoke about demon possession as being something that is caused by Satan. We lost our land. We lost our liberty, but we also lost our life. God said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. Romans 5 verse 12 says that sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men. Okay, now Adam didn't drop down dead. He died ultimately, but God said in the very day you eat, you will die, because man died spiritually. Death in the original language didn't mean cessation of existence. It meant separation. Spiritual death is when you separated from God. And so man was driven from God's presence. He died spiritually. And when we die physically, it's the separation of the body and the spirit. Man died both spiritually and ultimately physically. He lost his life. That's why Jesus called Satan a murderer. Who did Satan murder? Remember in John 8, he speaks to the Pharisees and he says, you're carrying out your father's desires. You're of your father the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. He was a murderer. Who did he murder? He murdered the human race. On the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. He murdered our first parents, and each one of us is born spiritually dead. And then finally, we lost our legacy, the ability to produce offspring in the nature in the image of God. It says that God created man in his image. We were created originally in the image of God. But when Adam died spiritually, it says in Genesis 5 verse 3 that Adam had a son in his own image. Adam was made in the image of God. So we, although originally we were created in the image of God, we now inherit a sinful nature, a sinful nature that is fallen and that needs to be redeemed. So when man fell, God had three options. He could have either caused Adam and Eve to die physically immediately, he could have left them in their sin, or he chose to set a rescue operation to redeem them, the kinsman redeemer. And so he promised, the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. He made that promise right in the beginning of a kinsman redeemer who was going to come, who would be a relative because he would be the seed of the woman. He'd be related. He had to be related. And so in the Old Testament we find that there were four qualifications that were necessary for a redeemer. Not anybody could redeem you. Firstly, they had to be a relative. They had to be related. Secondly, if they were to redeem you from slavery, they had to be free themselves. didn't help if they were a slave and they wanted to set you free. Then they had to be able to pay the price. Maybe they wanted to, but they didn't have the money to purchase. There was also the case that maybe they had the money, but they didn't want to. It depends, I suppose, how well you got on with your relatives. You know, maybe they were happy to leave you in, in prison or weren't really bothered to try and redeem you. So they had to be able, but they also had to be willing. And we find this in the case of Ruth. There was a kinsman redeemer who was able to, but he wasn't willing. When Boaz makes the offer to him, he's interested in redeeming the property, but when he hears it comes with the wife as well, he loses interest, maybe because she was from Moab. And he makes up some excuse and says he cannot redeem it because he might endanger his own estate. 
But now each of those qualifications was met in Jesus. Remember, he had to be a relative, and that's why he had to become a man. He had to become a man. He had to be related to us. And so Hebrews 2 and verse 11 says, Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. God became a man so that he could redeem us. Remember, the seed of the woman. He had to be born of a woman. He had to be a man, else he couldn't redeem us. And so, becoming a man, Jesus established the legal right to redeem us. As God, he was able to, he had the resources to, but he didn't have the legal right to, because he wasn't related. And so he was born as a man to become our kinsman redeemer. Then remember, he had to be free himself. Didn't help, remember, if you wanted to redeem someone from slavery and you were a slave yourself. Jesus, in order to redeem us from the slavery of sin, had to be sinless. He had to be free himself. And he was the only one who met that qualification. It says in Hebrews 4 verse 15 that Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. One John 3 verse 5 says he appeared so that he may take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Romans 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He had to be free himself, and Jesus met that qualification. Then he had to be able to pay the price. And Jesus was able in that unique position because he not only was the son of man, he was the son of God. His life was worth the human race. And that's why it says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 and 6, the man Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all men, he was able to redeem potentially all men. But he not only had to be able, he had to be willing and Jesus was not only willing to say that he considered it a joy. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says that Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning in its shame. Why? Because he wanted to redeem us. So Jesus was related. He became a man. As God, he was able. He had the resources. His life was worth the human race. And we see that he not only was able, but... He was willing. And so, firstly, he restored our land. Remember, Jesus called Satan a thief. He said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. And Satan, as a thief, stole our property. And what did Jesus say before he went to the cross? He said, now the prince of this world, remember he called Satan the prince of this world, will be driven out. But I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, that's when he's crucified, will draw all men to myself. John 16, verse 11, he said, In regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now remember, we're told that Satan prompted Judas to betray Jesus. we told that in the gospel. Satan incited him to do that. And if Satan had understood that Jesus was redeeming not only our lives and our freedom, but also the property he had stolen, he wouldn't have instigated Jesus' betrayal and murder. He wouldn't have prompted Judas and the religious leaders. And we told that. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 to 8 says, We speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age or of this world, that Satan and his cohorts, understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't understand that the kinsman redeemer had come back to take back the stolen property. And so in Zechariah 14 verse 9 says that Jesus as a man will rule over the earth. He will be the king over the whole earth. Gabriel, when he speaks to Mary, says the Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. Isaiah 9 verse 6, unto us a son is born and the government will be upon his shoulders. It speaks about him ruling with an iron scepter. But not only will he rule, we are told that we will rule with him. In Daniel 7, it speaks about the vision that Daniel has where he sees the Ancient of Days, God seated on the throne, and he speaks about someone who approaches him, and Daniel's astonished because that person is a man. He says, I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. But then he goes on to say, 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. It says he was given authority. This amazing prophecy that Daniel made, in the presence of God, he sees a man enter. Daniel sees God on his throne, he sees the angels, and then he sees a man coming. And he says the Son of Man was given authority and will have an everlasting dominion. And that's why Jesus called himself the Son of Man. And we will reign on the earth, we told in Revelation 5, with Jesus. Our property that was stolen, even though Satan is still the prince of this world, Jesus set in motion a plan whereby ultimately when he comes back at his second coming, we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years, we are told. And that's why in Revelation 11, verse 15, John hears a loud voice which says, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Remember, Satan offered them to Jesus. He offered them an easy way. Bow down to me and I'll give you all these kingdoms. They've been given to me. Revelation says they come to Jesus anyway. Kingdoms of this world have become kingdoms of our Lord. And he will reign forever. He restored our liberty. He redeemed us from the slavery of sin. In Galatians 3, verse 4, verse 3 to 5, it speaks about us as being in slavery and says that God sent his son, born of a woman, yet to be related to us, to redeem those that we might receive the full rights of sons. Romans 8 verse 15 speaks about, about us as being in slavery to fear. And what did Jesus say when he started his ministry? He said, I have come to preach deliverance to the captives, to set the captives free. He came to set us free from slavery. If you're in slavery to sin today, Jesus has come to set you free. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You no longer have to be in slavery to sin. He said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Romans chapter 6, Paul says, you used to be slaves to sin, but you've been set free from sin. Colossians 1 verse 13 to 14 says that Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, that's God, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You no longer have to be enslaved by sin. He set us free from the bondage to the religious law. We also told in Galatians, Christ to set us free from the bondage. And ultimately, even our physical bodies will be fully redeemed, we told in Romans chapter 8. It says, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And Paul speaks ultimately of the redemption of our bodies. Remember Jesus said that when you have a strong man, God in his possessions, but he says someone stronger comes and binds him and takes away the spoils. And he was speaking of himself. That strong man was Satan. He came and he stole our property, he stole our liberty, but Jesus came as the stronger man and he bound Satan and restored our liberty. But he also restored our life. We find that death is one of the works of the devil. Jesus said the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. He called Satan a murderer. Hebrews 2 verse 14 to 15, it says that Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The fear of death is the greatest fear that man has. And it says that Jesus came to destroy the devil because he holds the power of death. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work, we told in 1 John 3 verse 8. And God demands an accounting for those who murder. And in the same way that Satan murdered the human race, we find that ultimately there will be retribution. And it speaks in Matthew 25 about the devil being cast into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. One of the problems under the Mosaic law is that the kinsman could execute the murderer, but he couldn't restore his kinsman to life, he couldn't restore his relative. We have a wonderful kinsman redeemer. He not only punishes the devil for murdering the human race, he restores the relative to life. And that well-known verse in John 3 verse 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus said the thief came to kill, 
I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, have it more abundantly. And that's why in the book of Revelation, when John sees Jesus, Jesus says, I was dead, and I'm alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. He took those keys away. Because Satan had the power of death, Jesus took the keys away. Death only has claim to those who sin. So being sinless, Jesus didn't have to die. Okay, he didn't have to die. And that's why he said that no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. He laid it down to redeem our life. And then finally, we see that he restored our legacy. Remember, Adam wasn't able to have a son in the image of God because of his fallen nature. And he had a son in his own image. And so we are born in Adam's image, not in the image of God. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, comparing Jesus to Adam, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's Jesus, a life-giving spirit. goes on to say, the first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of this earth. And goes on to say, as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man. We've borne the likeness of Adam, we're born in sin. But it says, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. That's why we speak about being born again. We're born again into a new family of the second or the last Adam. And we bear the likeness in the image of God. He restored our legacy. And we find this beautifully portrayed in the book of Ruth. Uh, in the book of Ruth, we find uh, how Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, and their two sons move to Moab. They move away from Israel. And while they're in Moab, Elimelech dies. And both of the sons, Malon and Chilion, die as well. And they leave Naomi destitute. She's a widow in a foreign land. And there's also Ruth who's left as a, as a widow, Ruth and Orpah. And without going into all the details, we know that ultimately Naomi returns to Bethlehem where she came from and Ruth decides to come with her. And she gleans in the fields of Boaz. It was allowed for the poor people to pick up what had been dropped in order to feed themselves. And Boaz was a wealthy relative of Elimelech. He was a kinsman. And he shows kindness to Ruth. He assures that she has plenty of food. He actually tells his workers to, to drop more, to make sure that she gets lots. And he tells her that he's told his men not to, to touch her. So he offers her protection as well. And she's given this advice by an Naomi. She tells her to put on her perfume, get dressed up in her best clothes, and says that when Boaz is, is sleeping at the threshing floor, she says, when he lies down, note the place where he's lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. This was all part of the, of the law of Israel. And so we told in the book of Ruth that she goes down to the threshing floor and she does everything that she's told to do. She waits till Boaz falls asleep. While he's asleep, she uncovers his feet and she lies down at his feet. And we're told that he's startled in the middle of the night and he wakes up and he sees a woman that he doesn't recognize there. And he asks her, who are you? And she says, I am your servant Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Boaz tells her that he is a guardian redeemer, a kinsman redeemer, but there's someone who's a closer redeemer. In effect, what Ruth was asking him to do was, was to marry her, to redeem her. When she says, spread the corner of your garment over me, she was asking for a pledge from him to marry her, a very bold pledge. And you know that God uses that same term about us in Ezekiel 16 verse 8. God says, Later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you, and I covered your naked body. And he says, I gave you a solemn oath, and I entered into a covenant with you. God uses this beautiful picture of how we become the bride of God and of Christ. And the concern that Boaz shows for the widow reflects God's own nature. You know, God is the defender of the poor. 
There are many people who oppress the poor. Many of the rich oppress those who work for them because they have very little rights, if any rights. But it says in Proverbs 23 of God, don't encroach on the fields of the fatherless, of the orphan, for their defender is strong, that's God. He will take up their case against you. Jeremiah 20 verse 13 says, Sing to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy. God is the deliverer. He's the redeemer of the oppressed. And he promises to defend his people Israel. And he speaks about it in the same terms. In Jeremiah 50 verse 33, he says, The people of Israel are oppressed, and the people of Judah as well. All their captors hold them fast, refusing to let them go. Yet their redeemer is strong. The Lord Almighty is his name. He will vigorously defend their cause. Okay, remember, I'm the God who brought you out of slavery. He redeemed his people from oppression in Egypt. And so Boaz is a type of Jesus because as a relative, he, he also redeems us from our dire situation. In Ruth 3, we had that beautiful picture of a needy widow. She was unable to rescue herself, too poor to even feed themselves. They had to glean. And we find that she asked the kinsman redeemer to cover her with his protection. Cover me with the border of your garment. Cover me. And just as Boaz responds positively to Ruth's cry to help, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. And if you cry out to him today, he too will become your protector. He will redeem you. He will restore your life, your legacy. He will free you from sin. In the same way that Boaz redeemed Ruth. And Jesus started a new line of humanity with those who are born again. In Romans 8 verse 29 it says that Jesus was the firstborn among many brothers. John 1 verse 12 to 13 says, To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right not to become God's servants, but to become children of God. Remember what John says? What manner of love the Father has given to us that we be called the children of God. We are his children, we are sons and daughters. Isaiah 53 is a chapter that is prophetic of Jesus' death. We know that the Ethiopian eunuch, when he was reading it and he didn't understand it, Philip came and explained it to him. When the Ethiopian eunuch said, who's this guy talking about? He's talking about himself or someone else. And Philip explains that Isaiah 53 speaks of Jesus and speaks about how he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, speaking of the cross. He goes on to say in verse 9, He was assigned a grave with the wicked. Remember, he died among thieves. And with the rich in his death, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. So Jesus will have not a physical offspring, but a righteous spiritual offspring. He will see the light of life, speaking of his resurrection, and he will justify many and bear their iniquities. Beautiful prophecy of Jesus. He will see his offspring. We are his offspring. It says he became the first of many sons of God. And so, folks, to tell you once again, it's good to be reminded of these things, there was a price to pay for salvation, often because we receive it freely, we forget how much it cost. And 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 to 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore honor God with your body. I spoke a couple of weeks ago about that beautiful picture Jesus gave of himself about the man who found the treasure, and the treasure we saw was not Jesus, the treasure was us. The pearl was not Jesus, the pearl was us. Because he speaks about a man, once he had found that pearl, once he had found that treasure, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought that field. The other man, when he saw the pearl, sold everything and bought the pearl. Jesus sees us as a treasure, as a pearl, and he sold everything. We didn't sell everything. He sold everything and he bought us, he purchased us. And the redemption price was his blood. 
1 Peter 1 verse 18 to 19 says that you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed. You were brought back. You were lost, but you were redeemed. And how were we redeemed? At the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Ephesians 1 verse 17 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In Acts 20 verse 28, Paul says, Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Romans chapter 3 speaks of this redemption as well. We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Maybe you see it in a different light now. When it speaks about redemption, rather than thinking of it as a theological term, that very word implies that we were lost. And Jesus came to buy us back. We were originally his and he brought us back. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. And so with that in mind, we can appreciate the scripture so much more. Luke 1 verse 68. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. Galatians 3 verse 14. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. Titus 2 verse 13 to 14, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from wickedness. And then finally Hebrews 9 and verse 12, where it speaks about Jesus as a high priest going into that heavenly temple with the blood, his own blood. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and coals, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. And then we are told that he's given us his Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our redemption. If you go into a shop, you might sometimes put down a deposit. And that deposit is, in effect, you saying, I'm serious about getting this. In fact, so much so, I'm putting down a deposit. I'm going to come back and redeem that item. And so he's given a deposit as well, and it speaks of his Holy Spirit. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption. Remember, although he's redeemed us, from sin, he set us free from sin. We know that we do still fall, and we still sin. We know that although he redeemed our property, it's only ultimately in the millennium that we will receive it back. Although he redeemed us from death, we still get sick and die. But ultimately in the future, he has promised us eternal life. So in order to show that he's serious about it, he's given us a deposit. And that deposit is his Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So just to, to remind you, you could lose your land, your life, your liberty, and your legacy, and we lost all of those. We lost the land that was given to us. We lost our liberty and became slaves to sin. We lost our life, died spiritually, separated from God, and we lost our legacy, the ability to be sons and daughters in the image of God. And Jesus came, and we saw that Jesus was a relative. He was born as a man. But he not only was a relative, he was also God. So he had the power to redeem us. He was willing to redeem us. He was free himself. He was free from sin. And he not only was able, he was willing. And he's come. And he's promised us, he's given us that deposit, which guarantees that one day we get him our land back, we will rule with him over this earth. He's given us our life back. We are restored, that relationship with God. He's given us our liberty back. And he's given us our legacy, that we can be sons and daughters of God. Folks, I know that most of you probably already have made that decision to follow the Lord. But if you haven't, or perhaps you haven't understood it, I want you to realize this beautiful picture that has been given us, of how much it cost Jesus, how much he loved us, the story of romance, 